Today we have a panel of some awesome experts here to talk to you about AI for policy, policy for AI. There we go. Um, all of us are members or contributors to one of these two groups. But first we're going to start off with the intros. So I'm Andy Suderman. I'm a co-chair of the policy working group. I uh, work for Fairwinds where we build Kubernetes infrastructure for folks. I'm also the author and maintainer of Goldilocks and Pluto open source projects and a CNCF ambassador. I will we'll hand it off to you, Jimmy. Okay. Um, my name is Jimmy Ray. I also have done some work with the uh, policy working group. Um, I am currently a senior distinguished engineer at Capital One. And I've also worked at Boeing and AWS, you know, I've done policy for about eight years and, or policy as code for about eight years. And I just had my book published by O'Reilly Media called Policy as Code in July. And I'm actually doing a book signing down on the showcase floor today and tomorrow, if you're interested. Hey everyone, my name is Poonam Lamba. I'm a product manager for Google Kubernetes Engine or GKE. I do work on policy, compliance, and security for GKE. I'm a co-chair for the policy work group, so I work with Andy on publishing paper, um, setting direction, and you know contributing to the policy work group in different ways. Um, I've done that for five years now, and um, you know a lot of different things: building enterprise-grade uh, products and operating enterprise products. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Boris Kirchiev. Uh I am a member of the AI Working Group, uh, along with uh, Ron here. Uh, we've published a few, few things around uh, cloud-native AI and what that means and defining kind of the scope of that. Uh, as far as what I do, I'm a plumber, uh, currently looking for plumbing jobs. Let me know. Uh, and that's about it, Ron. The internet is just a series of tubes, right? It is just a series of tubes. That's all right. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Ron Petty. Uh, during the day, I work for a company called RxM. We do consulting and training uh, around cloud native tech, AI tech. If you've taken any of the certifications for Kubernetes, we might be associated with that. Um, also, as Boris mentioned, one of the co-leads of the cloud native AI working group where we put on uh, white papers and demonstrations of different uh, technologies. And here, we're uh, glad to be talking about AI and policy and related tooling. Awesome. Thanks, y'all. So real quick, a little audience participation. How many of you are using some form of policy enforcement in your Kubernetes environment? We like asking wow. this question because every year it gets to a higher percentage and it makes me very happy. All right. So to kick this off uh, with the first question, uh, Jimmy, since you wrote the book, literally, on policy as code, can you give a very brief overview of what you define policy as code as? <clears throat> sure. So my definition is of policy as code is policies you know, are code artifacts that are used to apply rules uh, and conditions. And those code artifacts, those policies, are interpreted by policy engines. And when the policy engines use those policies to apply these rules and conditions, they're basically implementing controls. These controls are based on, let's say, policies and standards that your organization may have created or adopted, like you know, 800-171 or 800-053. And when these controls are implemented through policy as code, you know, it's an automated way to you know, make decisions and uh, react to or even prevent unwanted uh, situations within the systems you use, Kubernetes being one of them. Awesome. Anybody else want to elaborate at all? Or we get? Uh, I think I will throw in the policy as code allows you to developer or create a developer friendly way to have your controls. Uh, that somebody that is not a developer has ultimately asked you to enforce. Uh, that's that's how I you know tend to talk about the the topic myself. You know, um, the decision makers in companies are business people, HR people, security people that don't necessarily have to live in code. 
uh, but at the end of the day, those decisions have to be implemented somehow on, on a system yeah. on large scale. Uh, so that's how I view it. Great. So feeding off of that, you know, you have requirements to, you know, do things such as compliance and we have to write these policies. So Poonam, what role does AI play or could it play in writing and uh, creating these policies? All right, so I'll answer this question in two parts. The first one, you know, what is possible? And then the second part, you know, what can we do right now with the tooling that is available? So what is possible? Let's say you are a regulated um, industry customer and you have to be PCI DSS or you have to be HIPAA compliant, you know, depending on where you work and, and what your business is. AI could potentially just go fetch the latest documentation for that standard. It could convert that into policies. It could apply those policies in your environment. And it, could, it, it can actually make sure that you know, it is collecting all the evidence, generating the reports that you need, which will save you the time, the effort, the money that you spend today to, to get to that level. It can even go a step further. Like for example, if HIPAA is changing or PCI, PCI DSS is changing, AI can detect that change, go back, modify the policy set that it had written for that particular standard before and do the whole thing again, you know, go change those policies, um, create a new sort of uh, report for, for your audit and, uh, and, and the loop goes on. So this is possible with AI in terms of you know, authoring policies and making sure that you are always compliant. Now we'll discuss, and you know, this is for your day zero or day one sort of workflow. Let's think about day two. Um, there are errors happening in your, your environment, and let's say those errors are repeating. So from an operational perspective, AI can detect that, hey, this is the problem, it has happened before, and it can actually recommend a policy that you can enforce for that particular problem. So in a way, it is helping you to get a more secure um, a posture, uh, a better security posture by learning how, how many errors are happening in your um, runtime environment. So, you know, we talked about day zero, if you have to write a policy or you have to be compliant, uh, AI can take care of it. And from an operational perspective, AI can actually help you improve the, the security posture as well. Now, none of the tooling or products do that today, but I believe that we will get there. This morning, I actually went to both Gemini and ChatGPT, and I tried to you know, generate a policy. I just said, can you give me a policy where I can enforce a certain label on Kubernetes deployments. Just super simple. Um, and I found that they were both close, but the code was not a 100% there. So I think it is helpful if you are writing a policy and if, you, if you're clear in terms of expressing that policy in English, you can still get some sort of code from you know, Gemini or ChatGPT, but be careful, you know, make sure that it is doing what it is supposed to do, and then you can use that piece of code. And I know I've taken long, but I'm gonna add one more thing, that um, I also tested a Google Cloud Assist, Code Assist. Uh, last week, we were doing a hackathon and we were testing the policy code generation with the Cloud Assist. Um, as well as Code Assist, and I think that was really good because it was able to generate very accurate policies, and the reason for that is we actually had written a specific agent to do that particular training for AI. So long story short, today, if you're clear in terms of what you want, I think you can generate reasonably good code. 
in future, I think AI is going to be a policy sort of co-pilot for you, which can help you stay compliant, as well as it can help you improve your overall security posture. Awesome. That was a delightfully detailed response. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, so going beyond policy uh, or writing policy, specifically what we were just talking about, uh, Ron, can you talk about ways that you see uh, AI assisting Kubernetes operators and users in the policy space beyond writing policies? Uh, yeah, I mean, Pranav really kind of hit, hit some of the key things. I, I'm um, taking a very tactical view of AI in, in policy. We have great languages and tools to, to enforce policy between Caverno and, and, and Gateway and, and all kinds of uh, other tools. Those tools, I believe, are already complicated enough that just even taking AI out of the equation, how do you know you're doing the right thing? Um, so between just crafting it efficiently and effectively, and then the proof uh, in the pudding, can you even go backwards and you know, explain upon what the results of these you know, implementations are? I think that's really where uh, I see AI today. So, even in our own efforts with the, the AI working group here at the CNCF, we, um, you know, how do you take something like a little more specific other than policy? Can you take, you know, for us, we, we've been trying to demonstrate zero trust. How can I know Kubernetes is doing zero trust? Just as a general statement. Um, you, you can walk around here and ask anybody what, what zero trust means and you're gonna get slightly different answers, right? So if you're already starting with some ambiguity, you know, how could we ever truly enforce what, what that, those statements are implying? So I think LLMs in that case actually do help because they give you that little bit of wiggle room um, to think about things and do things quickly to actually see how you might create those policies or check that they're being, being enforced. So I think very tactically, that's what I see it being used. If, if we stopped all LLM innovation today and simply take the ones we have now and use you know, fine tuning and RAG and things like that, I think we can level up just on the tactical implementation of policy and verification. But I don't think we're finished. I think we will still need um, better tooling around that, including not just AI. Like how do you actually take a complicated set of policies and actually mathematically prove these things are actually working as advertised, right? We can't just trust an LLM and be like, yeah, it's doing zero trust, right? So what, what would it take to show certain policies are actually really happening other than, you know, red, green, yes or no, right? There, there's more to it than that. So I think uh, we have to have better, better planning around that. But for the basics, I think we're, we're largely there for getting the just tactical uh, usage of it. Awesome, awesome. So, you know, we, we divided this really into three sections. This was really, you know, AI helping engineers do policy things in Kubernetes. But there's another angle to this, which is we have these AI ML workloads running in Kubernetes and, you know, we're doing policy enforcement in our Kubernetes clusters. So, Jimmy, what challenges do you see that AI ML workloads present that maybe more traditional workloads don't? So. Did anybody go to the uh, keynotes today, listening to the NVIDIA speaker? Okay. He brought out some really interesting points about, you know, they're running Kubernetes and their AMIL, M AI ML uh, workloads, talking about it's not good enough to like just move a workload because it had to be moved for some reason. You need to know what that workload was doing. You need to know what other workloads it was interacting with and what type of workload you're, 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 you know, what type of compute you're using. So when you look at AI workloads, you know, you could be doing model training, you could be doing inference, you could be doing prompt engineering and, you know, RAG, you know. And so you have to know that. And so I start to immediately think, how can I tell Kubernetes about that, right? But you also have to know what is the underlying compute that I'm using, right? You know, where, what, work, what node can this run on? I mean, does it need a GPU? Does it need a TPU? Does it, there's a lot of um, workloads where you still do CPU. They've gotten really good. So when I look at the complexities of how we manage Kubernetes workloads in general, 
if you think about how we would do like multi-tenancy, we would probably, you know, let's just say, you know, soft multi-tenancy, right? On the same cluster, you'd have to make sure that everything is labeled correctly. It lands on the right nodes in the right namespace. And then, oh, by the way, you have to validate all of that. So we already know how to do that with policy as code. You'd have to do certain, you have to do something similar with your AI workloads. You would have your AI ML workloads. You would have to understand maybe through labels and annotations, you know, the metadata that the API server will be able to, di to digest and send out to the validating and mutating emission controllers. You'd have to be able to tell the Kubernetes cluster more information about not just where you would like this to run, but where, where it has to run, what it's doing, geographically where it needs to be. I mean, there are all these things that now come into play more more precise decisions have to be made. And I think policy as code is the tool that interacts directly with the API server request flow to allow you to affect those changes deterministically based on you know the workloads you're running. Awesome, awesome. So taking that a little bit further, Boris, what kind of risks do you see emerging from AI and ML workloads that could be mitigated with policy enforcement? Yeah, I mean, Obviously, right off the, the, the top, we've, um, if you were here for the co-located events, if you were here at the keynote, uh, things like scheduling is a huge, huge problem that everybody's trying to solve, right? Not only are GPUs not readily available to those that are not named Meta or, you know, uh, <laughs> others, OpenAI, uh, that means that, you know, resource-wise, uh, policy becomes an easily enforceable kind of point, uh, but then you have to kind of scale it up. Okay, uh, I have to figure out how to resource my resource bind my uh, end users. But what happens um, whenever I'm going out into the cloud and my resources are now actual not a fixed cost but a dynamic cost? Like, how do I now? integrate with, um, you know, making sure that my, some group does not spend $100,000 in the span of three minutes uh, consuming all of the available GPU power that I have for my company, just as an example. Uh, and, you know, yesterday we were having a, a discussion around this kind of this problem uh, and I'm going to drive it back to zero trust because it is something that Ron and I are uh, dabbling in, but you know, zero trust requires things like encryption and transit, encryption at rest, and for the longest times, all databases, like less than a decade ago, uh, left it to the application to decide how to deliver the encrypted data to the database. Nowadays, I don't think there's a database that does not encrypt the data at rest for you, right? So the offload from application to kind of the infrastructure component has happened. And we don't have that yet, right? We don't have a way to um, bind things through a unified API, through a common API. Obviously, we have many engines, uh, and Kiverno is putting out some good work around giving you a starter plate, boilerplate around binding uh, resources, around binding and forcing, say, labeling so you know where things are. Uh, binding um, your uh, noisy neighbor problem. Uh, ML flow is creating a lot of uh, kind of good work around this uh, particular you know space as well. So you know we are marching towards the transition of hey the developer has to figure out how to make sure they don't step on everybody's toes or do not consume everything or do not uh, you know bring down the house as it were uh, but at the end of the day something like a built-in API whether it's in cube or whether it's in an admission controller uh, with a unifying standard will be necessary uh, and we're you know again as I said there's a few projects that are working towards that but we're not there yet awesome awesome so you know we haven't really talked about security at all, um, mostly about scheduling and resources and things like that. But from the security angle of policy, we already have um, PSS, the pod security standards. We always have, we already have the Kubernetes sys benchmark. Is there anything 
different that we need to be aware of, Poonam, um, going forward with AI workloads, or is it just kind of all the same? Yeah, so, you know, most of you raised your hands in saying you're using policy, so I'm sort of going to quickly summarize what PSS is and, you know, why CIS benchmark for Kubernetes matters. And then, you know, I'll take a very simplistic way of running AI ML workloads on Kubernetes and we'll see what works and what doesn't work. So PSS basically helps you reduce the attack surface for your parts. And the CIS benchmark for Kubernetes gives you hardening best practices if you're running a Kubernetes cluster. So it gives you best practices for control plane, gives you best practice for network security. It also has um, uh, guidance about uh, certain other type of policies and best practices that you will use to create the clusters and also to run the workloads in a secure way once the cluster is created. So that's a quick summary of what is PSS and what is uh, CIS benchmark and why it matters. Now let's think about the AI ML workloads. And I will bucket it into two groups, one training and two inference workloads. And I'm gonna take a very simplistic view, like, like I said. So for training workloads, you can think of it as a job that is running on Kubernetes. And if you've, if you've worked on bad jobs or anything else before, it's just as simple as a, you define a batch or a job in Kubernetes and then you just apply that YAML to uh, your cluster and irrespective of you know, whether it is using GPU, TPU or any other type of compute, it is just a workload that is running on a cluster. So I would say both PSS and CIS benchmark, they hold for the, uh, and, and they are important for running the AIML uh, training workloads. And if you think about the inference workloads in a very simple way, it is just like an application server. If you're familiar with Tomcat or Apache, you know, it's just serving the requests that are, that are coming in uh, based on the training that you've done for your model. And of course, you can do things in the data layer and, and other areas. But the security and hardening practices that are laid down in PSS and CIS benchmark also apply to these workloads. Now a third type of workload or a third type of platform that I've heard quite a bit is, you know, Ray on, on Kubernetes. And Ray is basically another abstraction layer if you think about Ray in a very simple way. And, and there are things that are done within Ray, not necessarily within the Kubernetes ecosystem, the way we run applications. So there will be areas where, you know, the policies as they exist today will not apply. So if you're running things like on your Ray sort of clusters within Kubernetes, then we'll have to think about what are the the guardrails that we have to implement or products that we have to build to make sure that those workloads are secure. Um, so I guess TLDR is whatever we have today sort of applies to AI ML, whether it is Kiverno, gatekeeper policies, you know, whatever tooling you're using will hold to provision the infrastructure and run the workloads on top of that infrastructure. But there are also areas which will improve as you know, AI space matures. Yeah, you took the words right out of my mouth. I, I mean, it, <laughs> the important thing to take away in this, in my opinion, is that the things that we're doing now and the things that we've been saying we should be doing and maybe aren't doing, um, they still all apply and we need to keep doing them. And then also pay attention to these upcoming things. So um, we have sort of a third section of this that I will happily get into, but we only have 10 minutes left. And so I want to make sure everybody has an opportunity to ask questions of our panel. So if you do have questions you'd like to ask, there is a microphone in the aisle over here. Please 
line up in an orderly fashion okay. to ask your question. And uh, we will try to answer all that we can. So if you don't have one yet, start thinking about it while I ask the next couple questions. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so we've talked about AI helping engineers do Kubernetes policy. We've talked about policy as an enforcement mechanism for AI ML workloads. And now we have this third kind of really, uh, I like to say squishy topic. Um, and this is really where we're gonna start to think about what are the concepts that we need to develop going forward as we do more of this AI ML stuff in Kubernetes and how policy applies. Poonam touched on it a little bit already, but um, Ron, the idea of policy inside of the model or inside of these workloads or in between the different you know, steps of these different um, you know, processes that we're doing, uh, it, it's kind of a really unexplored area. So what concepts do you think are gonna be valuable as we go forward in this world? Um, I, I think from a higher view, before you think about like policy in a model, enforcing the policy you know, internally, I think that's the dream we, we would hope uh, at you know, the sentient policy uh, enforcement. But I don't think we're, we're, we're ready for that. Um, I think there's some simpler problem, well, there's other problems that we'll need tackling first. So you have auditing kind of activities that happen now, right? People who may not have any technical expertise, right? As, as these tools become more powerful, how can those people trust the results that are being generated by an, an AI drive system in, in a, you know, I don't want to say ideal because people are afraid of losing jobs, but in a world where the, the computer is doing all the work, how do you actually know that these things are doing what they say they are doing, right? Again, just simply saying yes or no, that may be the truth, but how do you really, really believe it? So I think from a, uh, a different roles, we're going to have different uh, translation problems. So aud auditing type, you know, consultants will have, you know, they'll want to come in and say, hey, does, you know, again, do you do zero trust? I should be able to just you know, run something and it just, bing, tells me you're doing zero trust, right? Uh, how could that happen, right? And I assume you know, uh, that there's, there's a lot of automation that still needs to be developed and a lot of AI tech that needs to be developed to make something that simple uh, happen. One example I think that, that's very pertinent to my heart today is Kate's GPT. And it's the example that we use as kind of just like, here's a very simple tool that leverages LLMs today to kind of play around with rule enforcement and rule verification. And so just a real quick overview, KHGPT runs in, in two parts. Part one is a set of hard-coded rules. Literally, if I see this error, tell you that I see this error, right? And there's hundreds of them. Then the second phase is take the things that were wrong, send it to an LLM to expand upon it. Right? So the, you know, the hello world example of KHGPT is, is you know, the, the, the name of your container or your image is, is wrong. Right? So if you know Kubernetes, it's very easy to see, oh, you know, kubectl get pods, image pool air, it's very in your face. Not a big deal. But when there's hundreds of rules right, that are automatically swept across your cluster and you're, you know, here's 10 of them that are wrong, again, for an expert, maybe not so insurmountable. But what I find the value of these tools and including policy and AI tooling is for the junior engineers. They actually now have a faster path to see, you know, here's a good set of checks, including whether it's policy or just hard-coded, you know, SRE type rules. And not only do we tell you it's wrong, here is an explanation on why it's wrong, right? And then ultimately, as you go further down this, this rabbit hole, there's the agentic, um, aspects, right? Can I not just be told what's wrong, tell me how to fix it, right? And then the next step is, is of course, reasoning. How do you actually, instead of telling you there's 10 things wrong, how can I just say, in reality, there was only one thing wrong, right? Yeah, all your pods were mis mislabeled, but in reality, it was the deployment that was mislabeled, right? So there's actually only one problem uh, that manifested, you know, that's a very basic e example, right? And so, um, I think at all these different levels, people can benefit from these tools around rules management and what you do, but, but still there's that area between these. You know, you have 200 SRE rules. What does that matter 
to someone who's doing a PCI you know, DSS audit, right? Like what's the, the translation there, right? So I think those layers between automation at various levels with AI around policy is, is something that we got to work on uh, to make it even more, more useful. Five minutes. Yep. Um, you know, I think we should just go down the line here. And what are the next things that we should be paying attention to? What is already being worked on? So I'll uh, jump to you, Boris. Yeah, I mean, I think where we're uh, lacking right now is pre-LLM. Right, we have a lot of tooling right now that allows us to bind the LLM, to serve the LLM. We're trying to do some of these things, uh, like again, protecting the LLM through the LLM gateway, which in my opinion is not the right place to be doing that. Um, but what we are not spending a lot of time on is ensuring the proper gateways and the proper, I should say not gateways, but the proper controls are happening at your training, training data, at your inputs data, uh, at your confirming that, you know, the stage of your training that you are trying to achieve is actually where you want it to be. Ultimately, the SBOM of your LLM is not something that exists. There are things that kind of tell you what has happened. Um, and SBOM is kind of popular as has become the last uh, couple of conferences here uh, is still an incomplete standard as far as an LLM is concerned because you have so much more to cover and so much more to touch upon to, you know, prevent things like gender bias, racial bias, uh, insert, you know, when the internet is your training ground, uh, that that leaves a lot to be desired and a lot of controls that need to go in, you know, to make sure that you're producing something feasible and usable. Um, and we are lacking the tech at the moment. Again, there there is standards that there is rules that we can apply post LLM creation, but I am, uh, you know, uh, seeing kind of finally people getting the, to the point of. No, no, we need to insert effort into this kind of front half of the of the equation. Oh. Put them. Yeah, I see there is a lot of experimentation that is going on right now with AI. Uh, there are a few, like based on the conversations I've had with the customers, few customers who are running AI uh, workloads in production on Kubernetes. So. Over time, I believe that there will be more and more workloads that will, AIML workloads that will run on Kubernetes. And that means there will be some sort of standardization that will happen in terms of, you know, how do you apply policies at different layers to secure those layers. Uh, there is still learning that, you know, needs to come out of these use cases. But I think what we have today covers quite a bit of best practices and, and uh, you know, security um, hardening guidelines that we have. So start with that. Also, even if the tooling doesn't exist, at least from your perspective, uh, try to lay down uh, guardrails in plain English that, hey, I need to make sure that uh, this model has to have these boundaries in terms of data, workload, connectivity or how it is serving the request. And keep an eye out uh, both in the policy community and AI community. I think you know we discuss a lot of this every other week and we do a lot of work in publishing papers and, and also if you have any questions, you can reach out to us over Slack channel so we can help you design and model the requirements that you may have. <clears throat> so in the last minute or so, I think it's important to understand what's fueling your models, and that's data. And I, we've been talking mostly about running things in Kubernetes, but there are policy enforcement points all up and down the software supply chain, and data is one of those points where you need fine-grained authorizations or fine-grained access control, whatever you want to call it. And it's the scope and the context of the same data changes based on what you're using it for. 
And we are already running into situations where data is being misused or not used 100% properly. So I think that is the next piece that we need to take a look at. Maybe not policy inside the models, but policy as the guardrails or boundaries that are controlling what the, the models consume. Awesome, great point. We are out of time. We have uh, the standard QR code here, I believe. If you'd like to leave feedback, please do. Uh, both of our groups, I think, meet every other week. So please come to our meetings, share your feelings and thoughts about policy and AI. And uh, let's give it up for this great panel. Thanks, y'all.